Hello. Hey, Michael. Hey, Joanna. Hi, Aaron. Hey. Hi. Hi. Justin. Pleasure nice to meet you, Nice to meet you, Justin. So you are the founder of this incredible lab. Yes, me and my business partner. We founded Dirty Business, mm -hmm. um, oh gosh, 2012, I think it was. And it's been an awesome ride ever since. Super cool. And uh, there's a very familiar face, um, Michael Beck from Royal Gold. Good to see you, Justin. How you doing, my friend? It's a pleasure as always. Um, and this is so cool that we actually made it possible to see the two worlds of you come together. Because Indeed. I know their product to be such a premium product and having a lab to be able to substantiate and help the growers mm -hmm. seems like a perfect marriage. Absolutely. So what got you into um, the cannabis space and gave you the idea of having a lab? Well, I uh, moved up to Humboldt County in 2005 to get my degree at Humboldt State University. Okay. And I got a degree in soil science there. And during my tenure at Humboldt State, I was also working in the uh, cannabis industry inside of a grow store, right? Mm -hmm. I was in a hydroponic store. That's where I met Mr. Michael Beck. Yeah. Long before Dirty Business existed. Yeah. And before Royal Gold existed. Correct. Wow. Even. This goes way back. It goes way back. We have a tight community in Humboldt, right? Yeah. And so I'm in the grow store, I'm looking at the products, I'm slinging the products, I'm talking to the growers. The growers have issues, man, right? And you're there troubleshooting at the store with blind, no information. And getting my science degree, knowing that the complex you know, physiology between the plant and the soil and fertilizer and nutrient uptake and how complex that was, you know, going in blind helping our producers at the store was really difficult. Mm -hmm. And so as I uh, finished up my degree, I felt like a way to really contribute to the cannabis industry in my community here was to start a lab and start testing the soil and helping growers figure out what was in their soil, what was in their plant, what was lacking in their crop systems to help them improve the quality of their product, to improve their growing practices. And the access to scientific information for the cannabis folks was really poor. It was really poor. Um, they're really grasping at straws to figure out um, what products to get to fix a crop that's in uh, some dire strait of some sort. Mm -hmm. uh, so we wanted to do information and we thought, you know, people could figure out a lot about their soil if we tested it. So we started soil testing. And then people had questions about plant pests. What pest does my plant have? What disease is my plant getting? And so from there, our services led from just testing the soil to recommending fertilizer application rates for folks so they knew exactly how much fertilizer to reamend their soil with so they could reuse their soil and build their soil. And then we started identifying pests and disease to help people with their other crop problems, right? So it didn't just stop at um, soil lab data. They needed everything to help improve their production practices. And so really our our business was really led by the community of farmers and their needs. Mm -hmm. And uh, and just building the relationships too. Like we've always worked with Royal Gold to help with their soil testing, their quality control, the consistency of their products. And so helping the industry on that level too. And so they tied into our lab early in the get-go because they're also awesome about supporting their community and they wanted to support our lab. And so we started a relationship right early in the sort of beginning of Dirty Business to do their quality control testing. Okay. And that relationship has persisted, is still persisting. Yeah. <laughs> the necessity is the mother of innovation, right? Yeah. So having your foot and your fingerprint on the Humboldt community. Right that really gave you the opportunity to go, what do we need in this market? Yeah, what, what information did I want to know growing my own plants? Um, what information did our customers at the store need to know? Um, what information could we learn about and know better to improve our practices, especially around the use of pesticides, especially around the use of fertilizers, using fertilizers responsibly, you know, mm -hmm. not, um, not contributing to, you know, over nutrient, you know, nutrients coming into our watersheds and into our waterways. Our water quality here is 
epic and awesome and it's part so of, fertile and clean here it's so fertile and clean it's such a clean 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 water and that's a precious thing because many places in this world don't have the water resources that we have here mm -hmm. and so understanding how nitrogen moves in an environment and in a landscape it was important to us to help farmers understand you don't need to spend the money on it and you don't need to dump that into our watersheds and your plants are better for it yeah so i love that by yeah the way. And now I was talking to Aaron about this was knowing what pesticides are now in the water table and how that plays a role in testing and ensuring that we're compliant at the very end. Yeah. Or what pesticides are in the medium. Correct. Um, what type of uh, PGRs and toxic, Correct. toxic heavy metals. Correct. You know, starting with a really good baseline. Mm-hmm. How, this is so, in my opinion, so important to have a lab in your back pocket Absolutely. to say, I'm able to start off clean mm -hmm. and I'm able to finish and give safe product to the market and I'm going to pass final testing. Mm -hmm. I haven't had to do all that work and then fail because I didn't do my due diligence mm -hmm. at the beginning. That was a Absolutely. big part of why we started working with labs and having all of our products tested so methodically because at the beginning of Prop 64, as they started rolling out, even before it was enacted, they started rolling out the testing protocols and there were you know, multiple phases of testing as they ramped up the degree of scrutiny on the flower. Mm -hmm. We're like, we have to be ahead of this. Like, We can't have somebody that's using our product failing tests or we're gonna lose all our customers. And so totally. it forced us to look at every single component of the soil and to go to trusted people that could help us understand it and navigate that. And having Absolutely. had a relationship with Joanna from my early cultivation days from the store and you as somebody who's in the retail space understand this, mm -hmm. especially 20 years ago, that's where the experts were. You didn't have other resources for growing advice outside of your local hydroponic supply store. That was the mecca. That's where people came and talked together. Growers would run into each other and share ideas, especially in Humboldt where it was a little more lax. And that environment and that community, that relationship allowed us to like, all right, how can we make this better? Like we want to be good stewards to the community. We want to have clean medicine. We want to be a part of this industry taking the direction we want to see all industry take. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's walk in those shoes ourselves. Totally. And I think, Michael, you hit a nail on the head when you said we're manufacturing products and we want to make sure that we are compliant and giving the grower the end results. And as a yeah. nutrient manufacturer, <clears throat> I know how important that is that I'm not just throwing together inexpensive products mm -hmm. and trying to save a buck that might make you fail. Mm -hmm. You know, having all the compliance and the certificates of authenticity and be able to say this is clean through and through and we're not gonna be the reason why you fail. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. This is so important. And we've discovered a lot of other issues that are just beyond our inputs being contaminated here. You know, locally we have native soils that are you know what what we have here naturally and they have levels of arsenic they have levels of lead they have levels of cadmium mm -hmm. and depending on what your you know parent material is or what your geology is that your soil was formed from in your area you know we have people who are trying to grow in native soil here that have cadmium levels naturally in the soil to a level where they will contaminate a flower or an extract Especially and so cannabis pulls up a absolutely lot. it's, it's, a, it's a we're, we're known plant. it's a yeah hemp is known as a bioaccumulator yeah. right of heavy metals and so you know I think producers are faced with this like what is the problem is it the product is it my water is it my soil like ah you know so totally. teasing out really what your problem is can be quite a little detective journey sometimes with people because it isn't just as easy as I think the dude that sold me the thing ha has some stuff in it that's bad and um, it can be much more complex than that because we have these very complex growing systems and our geology here on the north coast is crazy it changes every you know because it's so tectonically active our soil changes it's highly variable region from to region 
No. You could spit block block. and it would be different. Mm -hmm. Really? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You could have a hillside where there's a, <laughs> a vein of serpentine in it or something like that. And, um, you know, it really is highly variable. So site specific, what is happening on your farm? Where are you growing? What are you growing in? What is happening in the environment has to be taken into account here much more than I think it used to be. I think people are attempting to grow in native soils now um, because we're allowed to grow on river bars, we're allowed to grow in open spaces now, we don't have to be hidden up in the hills. Mm -hmm. And now we're starting to run into some of these issues. We're starting yeah, we're to really to unravel. Regeneratively. Correct, yeah. So, you know, how do you keep um, your cadmium below, you know, what, 0.2 ppms? in your flower if you have, you know, that many ppms of cadmium naturally occurring in your alluvial river bed soil. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And that's where that's we what we're come grappling in with. And that's we're where like, we come in a lot of times, or do something that's different. You might have to grow in containers and you create may have to grow in containers or elevate and create your own living soil system outside Correct. of the native soil system. Mm -hmm. And that's what really drew me to the Dirty Business Labs also in the early days is they're like, you can't, I can't test your potting medium like I test the native soils. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what do you mean? Why not? It's dirt. Like, it's, it's soil. Dirt. It's, it's, it's just dirt. <laughs> it's just, and I know everyone cringes when I say that, but you know, that's that's it's the mentality. Soil. It yeah, is yeah. soil. It's I've soil. already got beat up by eight. Oh, okay. Dirt is what you get on you. Yeah, I've already got beat up. <laughs> soil <laughs> is what you're growing yeah, in. You sound like a broken record around here. I love it. Right? But yeah, you're entirely right. It, it's a different process because it's different material. Material, you know, yeah, you're yeah. looking at like something that's 70, 80, 90 percent organic matter versus something that's two percent organic matter. You don't extract them the same. And these are mm -hmm. things that Joanna explained to me. And I was like, oh, what? Of course, that yeah. makes sense. And yeah. it really opened our eyes to what we needed to focus on and how we needed to move and be nimble and improve our quality control, improve our research and development, mm -hmm. you know, and they've been a really critical piece of consultation. And so when they started moving towards, hey, we want to consult. We don't want to do the testing. We don't want to do the lab. We have education to do. We have another mm -hmm. route to go that is their path for affecting the world in a positive way. And they're like, I think, you know, we're going to move a different direction for the lab. And we're like, well, we need to bring this on board. And I cannot help. Like light bulbs are going off in my head all the time being like, what about food production? If we're doing mm -hmm. this for cannabis, how important is it for food? Because there are so many different regions in the world where there's so much toxicity, yet there's all this red tape for cannabis, but it's not transitioning over to food yet. Yeah, there's even with food production too, there's a whole um, modern advent of growing food that lacks nutrition because we've actually killed our soil. Mm -hmm. So if we wanna talk about, you know, Glyphosate, for instance, you know, <laughs> Roundup. Oh, oh. Can we can we get down on uh -oh. Roundup for a second <laughs> yeah, and yeah. like actual every food wine, production? Every wine in the Napa region has been detected with glyphosate. Yeah, glyphosate actually ha is um, is water soluble, so it can travel in our hydrological cycle yeah, and be rained water. upon us. So that's not great. That's why we have low levels of glyphosate everywhere now. Yeah, it's it's it, it, they rounded us up. Correct. They, they did round us up. Yeah. Not not high levels, <laughs> but but glyphosate works as almost an antibiotic, and so you're seizing a lot of the bacterial symbionts inside of a plant. We have a lot of um, microbial symbionts, just like our bodies do. You know, we've got well, intestinal way, we're, we're, gut. We're living too. Yeah, just for the, just for for the record. Know, <laughs> we're part of this whole cycle. Yeah, and the, there's actually a lot of things living on you too. Yeah. So the so soil <laughs> microbiome and, and skin you. microbiome and yeah. gut microbiome, they're all so similar and if share so many think, crossovers. Absolutely. If you don't think this is important, you are part of the living mm -hmm. biosphere. Mm -hmm. And uh, as human beings, we've been so, you know, we, as human beings, we've been so pulled out of that world. Yeah. You know, going to Burger King and crushing a hamburger. Yeah. And not realizing what foods and how health mm -hmm. and how, how important that is for promoting, hello, um, so sorry. Like sure promoting works. true health, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. I think I think you're you're onto that there. It's um, 
I don't want to pick up a tomato and eat it if it's nutritionless. Like, what is that going to do? But you know, if we why are people not asking that question? I think people are asking that question. Um, I think there's a lot of response globally to those questions. You know, there's a reason why glyphosate isn't used the Europe. same in Europe as it yeah. is here. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, you know, those are, yeah. So when is it that people are going to stand up and say, hey, holy crap, this is, this is my body, my health, and I'm going to care what kind of elements would, are in my soil? I would hope. I would hope that cannabis actually helps bring some of that under scrutiny a little bit. I feel like the microscope of scrutiny for cannabis contaminants, all the heavy metals and the pesticides, and I ask my those same questions, like why aren't we concerned about that in our other food or in the products we put on our bodies? Mm -hmm. Not just in our bodies, but on our bodies too. You know, there's very low standards for those things. And like, you know, cannabis has sort of shined a light even to like upstream contaminants. Like um, I know a product maker here that had problems getting beeswax that wasn't contaminated with kumaphos, which is a miticide that they put on cattle. And somehow that gets into bee products and concentrates down in areas where they use this on cattle. And uh, it gets into the bee products mm -hmm. and into their wax. And then they get dinged yep. in their products. So they because had, they are, use bees are important too, the bees wax. So, so oh, yeah. bees are pretty important. Bees are very system. important. And uh, yeah, and yeah, the colony collapse thing and why all that is, is because of nasty pesticides and fungi fungicides and pesticides and combinations of yep. them being used together. Um, is what they're finding out that's all about. Is I think it's really important to look at your five-year-old self and be like, are you really happy? Are you proud? You're profiting from knowingly killing the environment or, yeah. you know, we have to be cognizant of what we're doing. Yeah. And I, I want, if anything, we need to be awakened to why am I doing this? Why am I using pesticides? Why am I using toxins on, on my plants? Why, I mean, as a grower, I think every gardener needs to look in their backyard and go, hey, I have dirt. I eat the food in my backyard. Can I send my dirt to a lab like mm -hmm. yours? Yes. You guys mm -hmm. accept it by the mail. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. I get results within how long? Oh, three to five business days. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. See, one of the reasons why, I mean, people use lights for cannabis is because it was always hidden. Yeah. One of the reasons mm -hmm. why people use synthetic fertilizers is we want to make sure that you're able to flush those elements out before they get consumed. And we want to make sure the inputs are, it's a very short crop, it's a fast growing plant. So organics, a lot of the time you end up with those staying within the plant. You're unable to flush a lot of that out. But in my opinion, on the other hand, when it comes to harvesting trichomes and extracts and fresh frozen, it doesn't matter what's left in it mm -hmm. because trichomes you're not carrying a lot out over mm -mm. so right, right. I really like regenerative gardening mm -hmm. for trichome harvesting mm -hmm. and I think you get a much more um, tasty product mm -hmm. I think you get a great terpene profile if you're just colonizing all that beneficial microbiology in your root zone I think it's also using complex proteins and, you know, we're talking amino acids and phospholip. Those are good things, you know, that you don't get necessarily in a soluble fertilizer. You don't get those, you know, complex aminos that are in the fish oils, you know, yeah. you don't get that. All, all and that's what really acids. makes your organic strawberry taste better. It's, um, it's, uh, it has a lot to do I think beyond microbes and of course microbes play into it but it also has to do with like the types of materials that are coming out of an organic substance like fish or versus a soluble salt fertilizer mm -hmm. just yeah. big up on the amino acids they're really good <laughs> yeah. big time I, I, I want to touch back to that point you were saying about the beeswax and I also worked with a group of people that were having issues in topicals like right. that and Upstream contamination is a thing it's that insane. cannabis is highlighting. And we need to be aware of it. And that's one of the reasons I mean, we encourage people like, yeah, it, even if you're indoor, even if you're, if you're outdoor, if you're hydroponic, whatever, you should still 
take a look, get some insight, whether it's coming to our lab for soil fertility at Imperial Analytics or just testing for pesticides and fungicides through a lab that's appropriate for that, or looking at the heavy metals, look, looking at, you know, different things through different labs that are specialized in those pieces. I, we gotta take a closer look. And I, I feel like so many indoor gardeners never take this into consideration. They never test their soil. They never test their water. They're like, oh, I don't grow outdoors. It's even more important on your super short life cycle plant. You only have so much time. Yeah to actually get it right and have it be correct. You've got 60 you days up, of done. flowering. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, by the time you figure yeah. it out, you had a crappy harvest. So like mm -hmm. test right away, learn your system. And once you're running a repeatable system, mm -hmm. you don't have to test every single time yeah. as often because you have this understanding. You standardized but it. Work with a certified crop consultant or a soil mm -hmm. scientist to mm -hmm. understand the data because we're gonna provide data through Imperial Analytics. That's what we do. We don't provide the consultation. We want you to work with somebody in your area that understands your specific demographic mm -hmm. that you can work with effectively in a way that we can't offer the support. We've got Erin who's an amazing chemist and her team does a great job of boiling down the data to provide it. But then it's people like Joanna and her partner Sarah and some other really amazing local and far flung consultants that understand how to incorporate that mm -hmm. data into your system and that's mm -hmm. interpretation is key it's just a yeah. part of it we want to be able to use that that's that, that's a tool mm -hmm. in your chest that we didn't have so many years ago it's so important no and having and good data having good data is is highly valuable mm -hmm. and you know it really gives, gives an incredible baseline of this is where i started mm -hmm. this is where i need to be and this is how i'm going to get there and with legalization we're now able to use this as a tool in our chest. And I, I think that's really important. And I think it's really cool that, you know, a good example is we're pulling expertise from other industries where we didn't have the opportunity to have these yeah. skill sets and talented individuals in the cannabis space. Case in point, Aaron came out of the petrochemical industry where their data yep. is literally worth millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. It has to be correct. One error and you're off the charts. How cool is it uh, in the cannabis space being a woman-owned business initially? That's a rarity. Uh, yeah. How is it? <laughs> you, must be, you, must be, you must be relatively proud, yeah. you know, being one of the women banging the drum. Um, Very challenging. I, you know, it's interesting. I just have such a idea and vision. I just go out and bang the drum, and sometimes I don't even think like, oh, I'm, I'm the only girl out here doing this or whatever. Like, I'm just out there like obsessed with doing the thing, you know? Yeah. Um, so honestly, a lot of times it doesn't necessarily occur to me. Mm -hmm. um, but I've hit walls. I've had challenges. Yeah. Yeah. What type of challenges? I don't know. It's like. Have men taken you seriously? I mean, I, <laughs> I, I don't. I could care less that you're a woman. Yeah. Respectfully. Yeah. Totally. Um, what excites me about you is you're intelligent. You saw mm -hmm. a necessity. You saw a need, and you provide. You basically were that key in a lock for the for the community. I think that's fantastic. But mm -hmm. why is it there are not more women in cannabis? I think cannabis is it's a very competitive industry and it's built around a certain model of competition in this country that is really rooted in the patriarchy, I'll just say it. And, uh, <laughs> and I feel like, um, you know, being a, a woman scientist, being a woman business owner, being a woman in cannabis are three spheres of male dominated spheres of existence at the moment. And just playing in all of those has been an interesting, it's been interesting. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. And I, I, I encourage, I mean, I'm the father of a daughter mm -hmm. and I don't believe in having any barriers for gender. There's no excuse mm -hmm. why anyone with any gender should fail or succeed. It doesn't play a role and it shouldn't play a role. And mm -hmm. I'm really happy to see that you're breaking those stereotypes. And thanks. I want to see more cannabis and women owned businesses. I think there's a different perspective and valuable, I think valuable input that, that women have. And I feel like, 
competitiveness I don't think is bad at its core but I think how we engage around competition and how we engage with cooperation and competition and actually working together but doing your own thing and I, I think that that's all okay um, I feel like a lot of times though competition has like a, some sort of maybe e ego edge involved Alpha. in it and ego. yeah like it's about dominating not yeah. about learning or becoming better like I'm in competition with myself I think if anybody yeah. you well, know much more collaborative uh, yeah and I find Maybe. that, that uh, I think actually women are in a much more advantageous position hmm. to, be, to be in business personally because um, ego is not always such a major play in it. Alpha, dominating, competing, pushing, pushing someone down in business to yeah. get yourself up, right, is not part of the mo for women right. for the most part. Right. What got you into the cannabis space? The cannabis space. Um, let's see. Well, smoking it first got me into the cannabis <laughs> space. That was the uh, gateway, you know, yeah, to the industry. Definitely. Um, but actually, um, cannabis helped me a lot um, cope with some things in my life, just medicinally, um, some chronic pain stuff that I had actually at a really young age. And um, yeah, getting a relationship with that plant just right off the bat. And then I just really wanted to know everything I could know about that plant. And then when I moved up to Humboldt, you know, I got to play around here and there with some plants or whatever. But when I moved to Humboldt, it was like full immersion. You know, I got the I got a job working at a the garden store, um, let it grow, and uh, from there it was just kind of I got fully immersed, and my brain just had to take it all in. That's where I first met Chad, just before Royal Gold mm -hmm. started, um, and before Dirty Business. It's where I met Mike. Yeah, Mike, what got you into it? Well. You know, cannabis space, I came from, you know, smoking as a teenager and like really just delved in and, you know, I started cultivating at like 15 years old because yeah. I had a friend's dad who was, you know, doing it on the farms and he was like, oh, you guys come out to the farm and we'd like, you know, tend to the plants between the peach trees and like I just became fascinated with it and because of so much cannabis and consumption and skipping school, I had to take a plant science course through a college to get my diploma and I ended up taking this plant science course that just blew the doors loose for me and opened my brain to calcium and the gateways of the cell and how nutrients move and like how to feed a plant and I was like oh wow I can run with this yeah. and so you know that really pushed me down the road of cultivating cannabis and I was in Michigan at the time and I needed to get out of there to continue to cultivate cannabis so I came here and really Joanna is the catalyst to me being with Royal Gold. I'd been shopping with Let It Grow for a long time, knew the owner, knew a bunch of the people in the community and I was fascinated by cocoa. I knew it was the wave of the future. I was moving away from peat moss. I was unhappy with it as a medium, as a cultivator. And I went in and was talking to Joanna and she's like, you know, I agree, this is cool. Like Coco's definitely the way of the future. There's this cool local company that just brought this bag in and there's this clear, you know, infancy of packaging <laughs> bag of royal gold cocoa with a sticker on it. Yeah. And it was terrible packaging, it got algae it in it. Somewhere. it <laughs> and I was like, Oh cool and she's like, Yeah, it's run by this local guy and I was like, Oh wait, I know that guy. Yeah. and happened to know another good friend that was working for them, running the forklift mm -hmm. and doing deliveries and was the one that delivered the product. To my store. Just, <laughs> it was my roommate from <laughs> 10 years earlier. How serendipitous. So, and in Georgia, we were roommates. So wow. incredibly serendipitous. And she was like, yeah, just check this out. And I was like, oh my God, I wanna work with these guys. And that catalyzed me going and pursuing a job with Royal Gold. I was a grower, I was pretty financially solvent, good to go, I didn't need a job, but I wanted to work. I wanted to put a fingerprint on this community and culture, and I wanted to advance my own understanding and understanding my friends around me that we're all cultivating, we're all learning together. It was a really mm -hmm. cool environment in early 215 days in Humboldt County where we were collaborating like that. So, you know, I credit Joanna with 
funneling me down the pipeline to Royal Gold and it's, it's been an amazing journey and you know since we've had so many random serendipitous moments that all culminated in us coming mm -hmm. together purchasing the lab as Royal Gold so that we had quick turnaround times and a local asset to continue the testing mm -hmm. that we had continued to ramp up and get more and more serious about the data we needed and wanted and mm -hmm. being able to support growers because when they called and had a problem, we could be like, oh, let me pull up this soil report from when it was produced. Totally. And it just, it's been a rabbit hole for me of wanting yeah. more data, wanting to understand more and help other people understand more. And you've been more. on the show, like, I mean, you've been on many of our episodes. You just tend to pop up out of the woodwork and there's there's Michael from Royal Gold showing up again. I mean, you, you've been a, you've been a um, household guest. I, I just trust in the serendipity of the universe and try and follow each day and end up where I need to end up. And it's led me down paths that I couldn't have chosen myself. Yeah, well, we've been super grateful for the support of Royal Gold and Growing Exposed. And now to have the Soil Lab is just the next evolution of your company. It's so nice to meet all of you, thanks for being stewards of the plant. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thanks for having us Cheers on. Cheers, guys. Thanks for coming. Let's get out of here.